All right, looks like we have hit 12 o'clock noon. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you so much for joining us today for our brown bag lunch series. And today's presentation is gonna be really interesting. If you guys don't know, you will know. We are currently in bike month. So happy bike month to everyone. This week is National Bike to Work slash anywhere slash wherever week. We just want you to jump on a bike and enjoy your ride. So today's presentation is Whose Lane Is It Anyway? Sharing the Road with Bicycles, Safe Roads for All. So our presenter today is gonna to be Susan Jaworski, AICP. She holds a master's degree in environmental management from UMUC and a bachelor's in life science from Otter, Otterbein University. While she has accumulated a wide range of experience over her 20 plus years of career in national policy development, to local project delivery, Susan has found her passion in active transportation, which includes bicycle pedestrian um, planning. While serving in the community at HGAC, um, she can also be found regularly bicycling or walking around the regional trail system. So without further ado, I would love to introduce to you Susan Jaworski. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. The purpose of this presentation will be from the perspective of a driver rather than a cyclist. We also host cyclist centric sessions with an online bike safety course and we'll provide that information towards the end of this talk. Next slide please. A lot of the material provided for this presentation has come from the League of American Bicyclists and the City of Fort Collins Bicycle Friendly Driver Course. Next slide please. If I do my job well, you will have a better understanding of the most common crashes involving people driving cars and people riding bikes, as well as how to avoid them. We will also discuss what it means to share the road and why that is the best practice. We'll show you what it means for a cyclist to take the lane and why a person riding a bike may need to do so. Throughout the presentation, we will do some fun and formal exercises called legal or not that will test your knowledge of the rules of the road as they relate to cyclists and motorists sharing it. We'll talk about what we teach cyclists and teach you some cycling related infrastructure you are likely to encounter. Consider the transportation methods you use. Do you drive a car, ride a bike, are you a pedestrian? If you're like most people, you probably use several of these methods to move around your community. Next slide, please. Regardless of the transportation methods we use, we are all people and we all have loved ones. We are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children, grandparents, and we deserve to use the road safely. Next slide. There are two major takeaways from this course. First is the fact that a bicycle is a vehicle, and when vehicles use the road, they are subject to the same laws as other road users. Second, people on bikes fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. Cyclists should drive their bikes as much as they would a motor vehicle. Next slide. This leads us to our discussion about bicycling related infrastructure that you may see around town. Infrastructure is used to communicate about three things. First is the direction of travel. We may use paint or other pieces of infrastructure to help guide cyclists where and which direction to ride. Second, infrastructure can also be used to assist road users where to position themselves at intersections. Third, Infrastructure can be used to communicate to all road users where they can expect to see people on bikes. While cyclists are not obligated to ride in those places, infrastructure can help bring more predictability to road interruptions. On this slide are six examples of in infrastructure. You may also notice um, designated bike signals in the service region. A bike signal is also used to give bicyclists an advance to cross an intersection before other traffic in order to minimize potential conflicts. Directional paint, typically green, is commonly used to communicate direction of travel for bicyclists and to alert other road users where they can expect to see them. Roundabouts have a number of features to help people navigate intersections via various modes of transportation in a safe and efficient manner. In addition to traditional bike lanes, you may see protected bike lanes. These are the ones that have a physical barrier separating the cyclists from motorized traffic. In this particular photo, you'll see raised armadillos that are used as the physical barrier. Sometimes white vertical plastic pylons are used instead. Next slide, please. The curriculum from this course is data-driven. 
This is a brief overview of the bicycle accidents in the HGAC service area using data from 2015 to 2019. Approximately 14.5% of bike crashes account for all serious injuries or fatalities. Next slide, please. We've looked at statistics in our community as well as other areas of the nation to focus on the issues that are going to make the biggest difference and potentially save people's lives. Using the 2018 State of Safety Report, crashes involving a person on a bike and a person driving a motor vehicle make up about 0.5% of all traffic crashes within the HGAC service area. While this may seem like a small percentage, the more alarming statistic is the fact that up to 14% are serious or fatal crashes as we showed in the previous slide. The data illustrates that in general, bicycling is safe. A small percentage of crashes that take place involve a person on the bike. What it does mean too, is that people riding bikes are more vulnerable road users. Without a metal box surrounding them, they're more likely to suffer serious injuries if involved in a crash. When crashes do happen, who is at fault? The cyclist or the motorist? When you look at the numbers nationally, it's about 50-50. Half the time is the fault of the person riding the bike and half the time is the fault of the person driving the motor vehicle. We like to point out that intersections and driveways are where all people need to pay particular attention and that wrong way riding contributes to a large percentage of crashes. This leads to the next point on the next slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the takeaway point from the data and the reason for educating both cyclists and motorists is that most of the time, both road users can do something to prevent a crash. It's less important about who ultimately gets the ticket and more important that we all watch out for each other and ourselves. The rest of the presentation shows individuals how to do just that. Next slide. This brings us to our first legal or not exercise. Take a look at the writer on, um, on the screen. Do you anticipate um, is, she, is what she doing legal or not? And I'll give you just a few minutes to kind of um, think about it. If you guess not legal, you are correct. This person is riding against traffic on the roadway which is not only against the law, but dangerous. Now, what if, what if she was riding on the sidewalk and it's going against the flow of traffic? Would that be legal? Well, in some communities, it is against the law to ride on the sidewalk. Most of the time you'll experience this in downtown areas, even though sidewalk riding is legal in Texas for areas without a specific ordinance prohibiting it, it is often not the safest choice. This is the case because other road users often not looking on the sidewalk when navigating traffic. They're focusing on the roadway instead. That is one of the reasons we encourage bicyclists to ride on roadways and not on sidewalks whenever possible. Next slide. One of the most common crash involves a person on a bike and a person driving a motor vehicle is called a right angle crash. This is when a cyclist and motor vehicle impact at a right angle. Over half of all right angle crashes involve the person riding the bike going against the flow of traffic. This is often the case because people driving motor vehicles aren't expecting road users to come from the right. They're looking left at intersections and may not see people on bikes from the right. How do you avoid being involved in this type of crash? Well, as a motorist, it is essential to look left and right at intersections. In addition, check both the roadway and the sidewalk for cyclists before proceeding. As a cyclist, you can avoid being involved in this type of crash by riding with the flow of traffic and riding on the roadway rather than the sidewalk. If you do need to ride on the sidewalk, make sure you're diligent about communicating with other road users at driveways and intersections. Next slide, please. In this scenario, the bicycle is traveling eastbound in the westbound traffic lane against flow of traffic. The motor vehicle was coming out of the parking lot and made a right-hand turn. The bicyclist ended up getting hit and was ejected and slammed into the windshield of the motor vehicle, shattering the windshield. Next slide. 
what could have been done differently? Well, the bicyclists should ride with the flow of traffic in the eastbound lane. The motorists should have looked both directions right at the intersection in case there was a road user going against traffic. Next slide. Let's take a look at another scenario. This is a picture of a group of cyclists riding through a roundabout. Is what they're doing legal? If you thought that it was legal, you are correct. But what about the fact that they're riding in the middle of the travel lane? Doesn't that make what they're doing illegal? The answer is no. Cyclists may legally take the full travel for a number of reasons. And in the case of um, a roundabout, it's recommended that cyclists take the full travel lane so as to avoid being passed by a larger car. In roundabouts like the one pictured, there simply is not enough space for both a car and a bicyclist to use the roadway side by side safely. So what about the fact that cyclists in the image are riding to a breast? Is that legal? In this case, it is legal for cyclists to ride to a breast because they are not impeding traffic and there appears to be no motor vehicles behind them. And even if there were, they can take the lane together while in the roundabout and then single up after they're through. This is more efficient to get through the, through the roundabout um, quickly and, and efficiently. And it minimizes impediment to traffic flow as well. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about taking the lane. Taking the lane is a term used to describe when a bicyclist moves into the travel lane, often used by motor vehicle drivers and owns the lane for a period of time. By law, a person riding a bicycle is allowed to take the lane and even to impede traffic if needed for a number of reasons. While navigating roadways, a person on a bike might opt to take the lane because it is the safest place for him or her to ride at that moment. In many places, it is illegal to ride on the sidewalk, as we've discussed before. So sidewalk riding is generally considered not as safe as riding on the roadway. A person on a bike may also position themselves in the middle of the lane in a space that is tight and where motor vehicles are likely to buzz or squeeze by. The roundabout was a good example. Cyclists may also move toward the middle of the travel lane to place their bike over sensors in the roadway or trigger a, tra trigger a traffic light. Another reason a person may, on a bike may ride in other travel lanes besides the rightmost lane is to complete a turn. As we said in the beginning, cyclists should drive their bike much like they would drive a car and should complete left turns much like they would if they were driving a car. This requires the cyclist to move into the left turn lane to do so. Next slide, please. Okay, let's test your knowledge of the rules of the road for cyclists again. In this picture, is what these cyclists doing legal or not? Before you, before you answer, look closely at the roadway. A few things you should notice about this scenario. First, you will notice that there is gravel in the shoulder where cyclists would typically ride. Texas law states that bicyclists should ride as far right as is practicable as deemed by the cyclists. If cyclists feel it is unsafe to ride to the right of the white line due to debris in the road or for other various reasons, they may move to the, to the left as far as needed to ride safely. A cyclist may also legally impede other traffic if necessary if it is unsafe to ride to the right of the white line. What about the fact that these cyclists are riding too abreast? Do you see any other motor vehicles waiting behind them? This picture does not show any other vehicles behind them waiting to pass. So what they're doing is considered legal. If other vehicles come from behind and need to pass the cyclists, then they should single up to give more room for the faster cars to safely pass. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little more about taking the lane. As you saw in the last example, a person riding a bike may opt to ride to the left of the white line and take the faster moving travel lane due to debris or other obstacles in the far right lane. A cyclist may also take the lane if the roadway is too narrow to be safely shared with motor vehicle while still providing the minimum required three feet of space 
between the rightmost side of the motor vehicle and the person on the bike. As a motorist, in most Texas municipalities, they have ordinance that are required to give a cyclist at least three feet when passing. The three feet is measured from the rightmost part of your vehicle. This is likely the mirror, which on some larger vehicles can extend quite far from the body of the car. If you're towing a trailer, the trailer may extend beyond the body of your vehicle, and you need to take this into account when passing a person on a bike. An easy visual of, a, of three feet is it's the standard width of a pool noodle. Another reason cyclists may take the lane is to be more visible to other road users. There are a number of scenarios where this is the safest option for cyclists, but it can be especially helpful in congested areas or when a person on a bike wants to prevent positioning themselves in the shadow of another car and risk being the victim of another type of crash we'll discuss soon. Avoiding the door zone is another reason people on bikes may choose to take the lane. Next slide. In this scenario, the bicyclist was traveling westbound in the travel lane across the bridge. A motor vehicle, a big uh, dump truck, was traveling westbound in the same traffic lane. The motor vehicle driver tried to pass the bicyclist while traveling on the bridge by going to the other lane. Unfortunately, oncoming traffic forced the truck back into the, the westbound lane and collided with the cyclist. Next slide, please. So what could have been done differently? The cyclist probably should have taken the lane since that there was not enough room on the bridge for both of them to pass safely. The motorist could have waited for a safe and legal place to pass. Next slide, please. The door zone is the area beside a parked motor vehicle that the door extends into when it is opened. This area should be avoided by cyclists because they could crash into a door if a person opens one unexpectedly. Taking the travel lane is one way to avoid this scenario. It is important to note that there are a number of places in our community where the bike lane is painted right next to the door zone or where no bike lane exists on the roadway and there's not enough space for a motor vehicle to pass unless they are riding in the door zone. In these instances, Bicyclists should either ride to the furthest left part of the bike lane or take the travel lane fully if needed to avoid the door zone. It is also best for a person on a bike to avoid weaving back and forth from the travel lane to in between parked cars. A cyclist is more predictable if they ride in a straight lane, straight line and maintain lane position. As a motorist, Drive behind a cyclist who needs to take the lane to avoid the door zone until it is safe to pass with at least three feet of space. An easy way to um, open your door to minimize chance of hitting a cyclist is if you're sitting in your car, reach your door handle using your right hand. And what this does is it positions your body and line of sight into your um, into the side passenger or the side view mirror. Next slide, please. Now let's discuss the second most common crash we see involving a person on a bike and a person driving a motor vehicle. This crash is called an approach or a left cross. This crash takes place when a left turning vehicle turns in front of a person on a bike who is proceeding straight through the intersection. Nearly half of the time this crash occurs, it results in a serious injury. Can you think of any reasons why this may happen? Well, there's a number of factors that may contribute, including the motorist may misjudge the speed of a person on a bike, the person driving the car may not see the person on the bike because they are in the shadow of another vehicle, lighting conditions may be such that it is difficult for the person driving the car to see oncoming traffic clearly. This is particularly true um, at dawn and dusk. Next slide, please. So how can you avoid this type of crash? As a motorist, make sure to check carefully for all traffic, including cyclists before turning across traffic lanes. Don't underestimate how fast a person on a bike may be traveling. 
Some cyclists can travel speeds of well over 25 miles per hour, even on flat roads, and much faster if they are heading downhill. Keep in mind that a cyclist may be traveling alongside a larger vehicle and may be difficult to see. As a cyclist, be aware that turning traffic may not be able to see you if you're riding next to a larger vehicle. In some situations, it may even be best for you to take the lane to increase your visibility to other road users. Use caution at intersections and be aware of turning traffic. Also be aware that at dawn and dusk, the lighting conditions may affect others' ability to see you. Next slide, please. Here's another legal or not. Using what you've learned so far, see if you could determine what the cyclists are doing is legal. What about people driving the motor vehicles? Notice the cyclists are riding a single file and they are riding as far right as practicable. What the cyclists are doing does indeed appear to be legal. What about the motor vehicle drivers? Are they giving the cyclists three or more feet of space when passing? The distance looks good, but what about the fact that they are crossing the double yellow line when passing? Isn't that against the law? Well, not in this case. Motor vehicle drivers are allowed by law to cross a double yellow line when passing, as long as it is safe to do so and doesn't pose a safety risk for oncoming traffic. You can see a car coming in the distance However, it appears that both trucks will be able to safely pass and merge back over before the oncoming car arrives. Next slide, please. To summarize, when, a, when passing a cyclist, treat the cyclist as drivers of vehicles give at least three feet of space, space when passing. It is legal to cross the double yellow line as long as it is clear. If there is oncoming traffic or you don't have visibility to see if it's clear, slow down and wait for a safe opportunity to pass. Attempting to squeeze by a cyclist is illegal and cause, can cause a crash. Once you pass a cyclist, you know if it is safe to reclaim the lane when you can see them in your mirror. Next slide, please. The third most common crash we see involving a person on a bike and a motor vehicle driver is called a right hook. This is when a motor vehicle driver turns right across the path of a cyclist causing a crash. The right hook may take place for several reasons. A motor vehicle driver may misjudge the speed of a cyclist and complete a right hand turn in front of him or her. A motor vehicle may, driver may also turn in front of a person on a bike who is waiting at an intersection at a red light or a stop sign. The car driver may also not signal a turn and this could cause a crash. In addition, a cyclist who is riding on the sidewalk and rides into the intersection may experience a right hook because the driver of the car is not expecting someone on the sidewalk to enter the roadway. Next slide, please. Here are a few things you could do to avoid a right hook crash. As a motorist, treat the bike lane similar to other travel lanes. While it is not legal to drive in the bike lane for long distance, you can drive through the bike lane to complete a turn. You will notice that the left hand side of a bike lane is often dashed. This is to indicate to road users that the bike lane may be passed through when completing a turn. In many cases, it is best to use the bike lane similar to a right-hand turn lane. When completing a turn, signal and check for cyclists, including in your blind spot. Once it's clear, move over into the bike lane before completing the turn. By owning this space before you make the turn, you avoid a potential conflict or crash with the cyclist. If a cyclist is present and you wanna make a right-hand turn, it is generally better to slow down and keep the cyclist in front of you. Let the person on the bike clear the intersection and then complete your turn. As a cyclist, you have a few techniques you can use to avoid being right hooked. You can choose to take the straight through travel lane and position yourself in a way that makes it obvious that you're going through the intersection rather than turning. 
This is especially effective when the bike lane is positioned on the right hand side of a right turn lane. You can also watch for signals on cars so you can anticipate when someone is planning to turn right. You can also make eye contact with drivers to make sure you're seen. Recognize that it is legal and preferable for a person driving a car to use the right bike lane as a turn lane. This helps the driver communicate their intentions to cyclists and helps prevent a conflict. Remember, it's about predictability. Ride defensively and know that people may misjudge your speed. Be prepared to stop quickly or maneuver your way out of a crash if someone does right hook you. Next slide, please. By now, you've probably gotten this down. Take a look at this one. Is this legal or not? Are the cyclists riding legally? What about the person driving the car? <clears throat> the cyclists are riding on the white line, but they appear to be riding as far to the right as is practical. You're, you're correct. There is debris in the shoulder, which would make it unsafe to ride further to the right. In addition, the cyclists are riding single file and are minimizing impediment to traffic. What they're doing is legal. The car, on the other hand, is not. It's, they aren't giving enough space to the cyclist when passing. Look at how close that mirror is to hitting the riders. The oncoming travel lane is clear and the person driving the car can legally cross the double yellow line to give the cyclist the required three feet of space. The motorist actions are not legal. Next slide, please. Here are a few more tips when passing a cyclist. Check your blind spots for people on bicycles. You know it's clear when you can see the person in your mirror. When driving larger vehicles or vehicles with trailers, keep in mind that the mirrors and trailers often extend a significant distance from the body of the vehicle. Allow extra room when passing a cyclist. Wind blasts from larger vehicles have a tendency to throw a cyclist off balance. You can help prevent a person on a bike crashing by reducing your speed and giving them plenty of space. Next slide, please. If you come across a group of riders, often called a peloton, there are a few things you can do to pass safely and legally. If the group is not riding single file, you can lightly very lightly tap your horn to let them know you're behind them. Sometimes riders cannot hear vehicles coming from behind due to road noise and wind. After lightly tapping your horn, give the riders time to single up. It takes a lot of negotiating when riding in a big pack to line up safely. Once the riders have singled up and the oncoming lane is clear, pass with a minimum three feet of space. It is best to avoid blasting the horn as this can cause, surprise a person on a bike and cause a crash. And when it's a big group, if one person goes down, you could take 10 other people with you. Next slide, please. And there's a question of what should bikers do when they see a large vehicle pass them? Um, line up go in a single file line um, if, and maintain the lane position, be as predictable as possible. Here are a few things to keep in mind. Distracted driving is a major cause of crashes. Avoid texting or talking on your phone. It really could save a life. An illegal courtesy is when a person is trying to be nice but inadvertently does something illegal, which can also be unsafe. An example of this is when a person driving a car stops in the middle of a travel lane without a stop sign or traffic signal in order to let a person on a bike turn left. This is problematic because other road users are not expecting the person in the car to stop and it may cause a crash. When you are driving, it is best to be predictable and take the right away when you have it and give the right away when it is only legally correct to do so. Another safety issue to keep in mind is where you park your car. Most places it is against the law to drive in or park in a bike lane. Parking in bike lanes is not only 
against the law, but it can cause a serious safety issue for a person on a bike who is then forced to weave into the traffic to get around the parked cars. Look for another place to park your car that is legal and it will help keep people safe. We would also like to highlight the fact that motor vehicle drivers need to use extra caution when driving in areas where children are likely to be present, such as neighborhoods or school zones. 80% of crashes involving a motor vehicle driver and a child on a bike are due to the child darting into traffic. Help keep kids safe by reducing your speeds and being on the lookout in higher traffic areas where their children are likely to be present. Before we move on to the next section, let's review the major points we've covered in the last few minutes. Passing a cyclist can be done safely when using a few of the tips discussed. Give at least three feet of space when passing and be mindful you may need to move over more if driving a larger vehicle. It is legal to cross the double yellow line if you're passing in order to give the required three feet of space and it is clear to do so. You know when it is safe to return to your lane when you can see the cyclist in the mirror. Next slide, please. As part of this training, we would also like to point out a few things that we teach cyclists as part of our cycling related education. We offer, we offer a variety of, of classes for people who ride bikes to create safer roads for everyone. And this will be discussed in our bike centric safety class that's offered in a few minutes. Just as we discussed in this training, we teach cyclists when and how to take the lane. We teach them how cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles because it makes them more predictable. We teach them to ride as far to the right as is practicable, practicable and to move away from the right-hand side of the road when it is appropriate, such as changing lanes to complete a turn or when it's unsafe to ride on the far right. When teaching cyclists, we also reinforce the fact that cyclists should drive their bike like any other vehicle. In the HGAC service area, cyclists are expected to obey stop signs and stoplights just like any other vehicle. <clears throat> Driving a bike means that cyclists should also obey first come first served at intersections such as four way stops. They need to yield to traffic, faster moving traffic when changing lanes and it is important to communicate to other road users their intentions by where they position themselves in the travel lanes. Next slide, please. We also teach cyclists that by law, they are required to signal. The only exception to this is if it is unsafe for a person riding a bike to remove their hand from their handlebar to signal when they are, then they're not required to do so. If a person is not able to signal with their hands, we teach them that still use an audible signal, such as shouting, turning left, or stopping. These are the hand signals that are legal in Texas. Signal a left turn by extending the left hand straight out. A right turn can be signaled by bending the left arm at a right angle and pointing the hand upward, or by simply extending the right arm to the right. A cyclist should also signal when they are stopping which is done by bending the left arm at a right angle and pointing the hand down towards the ground. Another option that you may see is kind of the universal military sign to stop by holding up your arm and making a fist. Next slide, please. To wrap up, here are a few main points to remember when sharing the road with people on bikes. Cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. 80% of crashes happen at intersections. Pay special attention when approaching intersections and driveways. And remember the tips that we shared earlier about avoiding the top three crashes, right angle, left cross, and right hooks. Cyclists may need to take the lane and can legally do so for a variety of reasons, including for safety and to position themselves to be predictable road users. Motor vehicle drivers must give cyclists at least three feet when passing in order to keep everyone safe. Motorists may cross a double yellow line to provide that three feet, if needed, as long as oncoming travel lane is clear. Remember to check your blind spots and be aware that when lar operating larger vehicles, they can create dangerous wind blasts that may require more than three feet of space when passing. We're all people trying to get where we need to go Sharing the road is the best way for us all to arrive, 
efficiently and safely. Next slide, please. We are bicycle uh, centric um, bike safety course is called Cycling Savvy. It is completely free to everyone within the HGAC service area. It's a self-paced online course and it's divided into two sections. It's approximately two hours to complete and you're able to spend as much or as little time so you can add it to your schedule as, as you're able. And it covers everything from traffic system to bicycle specific laws to defensive driving strategies. Um, you can register online either through our website at hgac.com slash bike safety or directly through houston.cyclingsavvy.org. Next slide, please. Um, coming soon in the fall will be a on the bike bike handling component that we will be um, offering in the seven outlying um, counties outside of Harris County. Next slide, please. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, Susan. So at this time, we are open for any questions that you may have. Please feel free to um, drop your question in the chat box and we will ask those and get those answered for you right now. So I do have one question for you in regards to the cycling savvy. Is there an age limit on that? Because it seems like it could be something very helpful um, since we're approaching summertime and some of these kids, high school kids, junior high kids might be riding their bikes a little bit more. Do you think that would be something that they could jump on and you know do and learn about the rules of the road when it comes to bicycling? Oh, absolutely. This is definitely the Cycling Savvy course is for all age ranges. Um, so probably from, um, I would say kindergarten, first grade, um, all the way up. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. So it looks like Nat dropped um, the Cycling Savvy link. Thank you, Nat, for doing that. Um, so the link is there. Also, Brian says, what should I look for in a helmet as a first rider? Um, that's a very good question. Um, one, of the, one of the things to, most of the time, it will be certified for, for safety. So that's not so much of an issue as it used to be. So a lot of it now is really about fit and making sure that, that um, you tailor it to you. So it'll have come with padding. Um, make sure it's the right size. Um, make sure it fits snug. So that way, whenever you have the helmet on, it should be, it should fit about two inches above, you know, above your eyebrow. And it should be snug to where it doesn't move. You're able to turn your head and it needs to be clasped where you have a couple of fingers under your chin. So that way it's not so tight, it's choking you, but it needs to be tight enough that if you get hit, it stays on and protects your head. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions right now? Anybody else? So it looks like we have one more. Um, David Dick says, note that the three foot rule um, also applies when passing cyclists in bike lanes. Many Houston lanes are not wide enough. Um, so thank you for that. I lost my place here. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, he did mention that it's six feet for commercial vehicles. It's that's that's a general rule of thumb. Um, right now, there is legislation that's in the Texas um, legislature that we're hoping is passed this year that will mm -hmm. make it official. Unfortunately, Texas does not have a uh, bike passing law. Um, we were close a couple of years ago to getting it, and it looks like this year we might might get it and the way the law is written, it would be three foot for passenger vehicles and six feet for commercial vehicles. But sometimes it should be more. I mean, it really just depends on speeds and um, judging by, by the riders and the conditions. 
Perfect, thank you for that. Do we have anything else? Houston does have that ordinance. Correct. There are, that's and that's where municipalities will usually would get through to or specific ordinances for it. Thank you for that, David. Do we have any other comments or questions? No? Okay, so um, before we close out, I do want to give a few closing remarks. First of all, Susan, thank you so much for your presentation. We enjoyed it. I'm sure, I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure many of the others learn a lot. Oh, we have one more question. Do you have locations for the fall classes? We are currently in process of, of trying to um, choose those locations. So as of right now, we do not, um, but we should have them within a month or two. And we'll have that posted to our bike um, safety website through HGAC as well. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Eileen, for that question. Um, Susan, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure others did as well. I'm placing our bike month uh, link in the chat. It's a super long link, so I do apologize for that. But that link right there will take you to the HJC website, Bike Month page. You can go there to get all your resources on Bike Month, um, find all of your information for Bike Month activities. We are halfway through the month, so we've already gone through some of our activities, but we still have some more activities to come, not just through HJC, but a lot of our regional partners as well are participating in Bike Month. Um, and so look, take a look and see if someone near you is hosting a Bike Month event um, that you can participate in and just get out there and enjoy your ride. We also have a presentation tomorrow. So tomorrow we will be presenting on um, the benefits and perks of becoming a Commute Solutions Partner as well. So if you're interested in becoming a Commute Solutions Partner, or if you'd like to know more about the Commute Solutions Program and what our benefits are, what services we have to offer, tune into that. That'll be at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. And my name is Francis Rodriguez. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I am going to leave my email address in the chat box. Anything um, that you guys need help with assistance with, um, if you need me to put you in contact with someone, I am more than happy to shoot me an email and I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Um, at this moment, I think we are ready to wrap up. Oh, one last thing. We will have a closing celebration in regards to bike months later this month on May 27th. So that's another activity that you might want to tune in for. That one will be held through Zoom as well. So take a look at our website, see if you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'm happy to get you all the information, links, whatever you need so that you can attend, participate. I'm happy to help. Um, Susan, do you have anything else before we close out? Um, just get out there and enjoy the weather as much as you can and enjoy being on, rediscover the joy of biking. Awesome. Well, we thank you so much for joining us. Our next brown bag will actually be held in June. It's actually a rescheduled brown bag. This one was um, initially going to be earlier during the year when we had the freeze. Um, and it's our Neuro Houston presentation. And Neuro Houston, um, they do driverless self-driving delivery service. It's a self-driving delivery service. It's going to be extremely interesting as well. That presentation is going to be June, doo -doo -doo, I believe June 20th. Let me double check real quick. June 21st. So June 21st um, as well. Like I said, if you need to get link, I'm more than happy to send that out to you guys as well. So tune in for that one as well. Any questions, shoot me an email. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.